Welcome to the Make Lemonade podcast, formerly known as the Niche Website Builders podcast. Today, we have Mitch Royer on, and we talk books, events, and speaking. Now, this might seem kind of outside the niche website space, but I think with many people being scared of AI and Google's recent uh, SGE updates, they might be thinking about how they can further diversify and build their brand. And I think this is a really good chat for anyone who's a little more established with their sites, maybe making more money, having a personal brand or the site around them or something to do with their expertise, then this will hugely benefit you, even if you're not at, in that uh, level yet. These are th some things to think about going down the line. And so we talk about publishing books, the best way to go about it, why even do it, and what are the benefits of doing it. And then we also dive into speaking events, how you can leverage that book to get on podcasts, do different speaking events, how you can charge more because you have a book. And then going into hosting events and the idea of hosting workshops, how to make your events stand out, what it's like to really have an experience at an event. And Mitch gives a lot of different examples, a lot of high level, I guess you could say influencers that he's working with, a lot of people that are on the Joe Rogan podcast, developing events, speaking books for these people. Um, and we just dive into the things that he's doing there and how you can think about doing this for yourself or even going through Mitch to do it. Um, if you have that kind of capital and that kind of uh, following to do that. Uh, and I think this is where it's really beneficial to really build and solidify your brand and be very influential in whatever space you're in. So sit back and enjoy. Are you ready to get serious about building a profitable brand online? Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. We bring you the latest field-tested tips, tricks, and strategies for building a profitable online business. We interview industry experts, share customer success stories, and reveal our own experiences working on hundreds of sites to inspire and motivate you to make something happen. This podcast is brought to you by Make Lemonade. Whether you've launched your business yesterday or you're already a market leader, Make Lemonade will help you rule your world. Head over to makelemonade.agency forward slash show for the latest offers on our services. Let's do this. Welcome to the Make Lemonade podcast, formerly known as the Niche Website Builders podcast. Today, Mitch Royer. Welcome, Mitch. Hey, thanks for having me, James. I appreciate it. No, thanks for coming on. I think this will be really interesting for a lot of people listening here. Usually we we kind of get somewhat towards the beginner, someone who's looking to go full-time with their niche website or different monetization strategies around that. But today we're going to take it a little more to the established blogger or established niche website owner and how you can further monetize and further build your personal brand or your website brand. So this is why I'm quite excited about this one. This is some stuff I've been thinking about. And Mitch has plenty of expertise in this area. So do you want to give a brief background about yourself, Mitch, and uh, what, what you're up to? Yeah, definitely. So I uh, come from, uh, I'm a, I was a third generation pastor uh, growing up in the Midwest. And uh, from that, I fell in love with communication. So, um, you know, I did a lot of speaking in front of uh, small groups, large groups, um, you know, from small as a couple, couple handful of people to uh, thousands of people. And through that process, because of uh, the love for communication, I went to Indiana University, which is yeah, Indiana. That's what you did if you lived in Indiana. <laughs> you go to uh, Indiana University, and I studied uh, public relations and communications. And uh, from that kind of came the love of, of connection. And so uh, moved kind of all around, all over the place, but ended up in Austin. And through the process of moving to Austin, what uh, kind of came from that was my desire to start companies and um, be able to use the relationships that I've, I've, I've gotten over the years in uh, my one-on-one -on -one connections and larger group connections in the church world and then put them into how do we use that into a deeper level of connection and community. And what I found that to be was events. And so I got into event production with a group called Craftsman Events, and we do large events across Texas and across the country. And what I found with those events and why I loved it was not only do I love logistics and execution uh, of creative ideas, but also 
the community that's built in the process. So people that you normally would never meet, um, they volunteer for something, they're a part of, of uh, maybe they're a hired hand in the group, and then through that you build a common connection. And that common connection is usually the event itself. Um, and that's uh, very the, probably the biggest part of what I did through that process. And because of that, I got into just getting to know a ton of people. So whether it's hiring bands, look, you know, local bands or larger size bands to be a part of our festivals or people that just I interact with through time. What I got really into was the fitness side of things. So the fitness outdoor space. And because of that, I got to know some of the people that I follow on uh, social medias. I consumed their content and became friends. And so because of that, the relationship that I had was uh, a literary agent who has a, a company over the last 25 years called The Fed Agency, which does um, literary entertainment agency that works in, first and foremost, publishing books. And so one of the biggest, one of our big clients is Tim Tebow. Uh, we, we work with a lot of different people in all different spaces, um, outdoor space, fitness space. And, and through that process of just me bringing a ton of uh, just people that I knew that wanted to write books to Esther, who's the owner, um, she just said, hey, why don't you come on board and work with us? You can keep doing all the cool stuff you're doing. We want to break into the speaker space because I've been doing a lot of speaking tours for, for people that have a decent following. Um, we would like to be in that space as well, but also we think you'd be really good at just building great connection with authors, potential authors, people that are young entrepreneurs, people that are influencers in different spaces that would be willing, that would see this as an opportunity to move, uh, tell their story. And that was the most important part through that process. And so that brings us here. You know, I'm working at the Fed Agency. I run uh, an event production company. And through that, through those two things, basically, they also intermix with one another that it just makes sense. Um, people that I love, people that I'm fans of first are people that I bring forward and say, hey, like, I'm a fan and I want to hear more about your story. So let's connect those two things together. All the while trying to build out their um, brand through doing like, hey, we could book you speaking gigs, which we do, or we could build out your own tour. And through that process, what we've done is, is seen a lot more traction and people wanting to own their own content. Because what happens is if, you, if, you're, if you're in music, if you're in the speaking space, typically you're a hired hand. Hey, I'll pay you 20 grand, I'll pay you 30 grand, I'll pay you whatever for you to come and speak for 30 minutes to an hour. But what people are seeing is like, hey, I'd rather own my own thing Yes, I lose if we lose, but I win big if we win big. And so most people are betting on themselves now, which is awesome to see from an entrepreneur's perspective is, hey, let's, let's invest in yourself and let's make sure that when you win, you win big. Um, because as you know, in your space, especially in the world of having many careers like I've had, many different careers, <laughs> you can make money pretty well doing anything. Yeah. You can figure out how to make a living. It's what do you want to do and are you willing to bet on yourself? Yeah, nice. Do you want to maybe name drop a few of the names you're doing events for that I'm sure people might know? Yeah, so uh, one of them is, I'm first and foremost was a fan. A lot of people that have been on Joe Rogan. <laughs> so that's kind of the first thing is friends of Joe Rogan are a huge opportunity, uh, but I'm just friends with them personally. Just I really love what they bring and their personalities. One of them is Cameron Haynes. He's an uh, endurance athlete. He's an outdoor, um, outdoor specialist bow hunter. Kind of that's how he got his name. Um, but he runs like a marathon a day to train for a backcountry bow hunting. He's a psychopath. He's a savage. <laughs> and he's one of my favorite people in the world. Um, so he's pretty well known. And then there's a guy that's a local guy, but actually he's nationally known. His name's Nick Bear. And we're working on a lot of different projects, one of those being a book. Uh, but more importantly, just going, hey, where do we want to take your – um, he's a great communicator. Uh, how do we build stuff around his personality already, his fan base, and then expand that fan base even further? Um, the, so then there's another one named Corey Morrow. He's, a, he's more of a uh, Texas country artist. He's famous in Texas, which is actually, it's his own subculture. If you've lived in, <laughs> in Texas, it's the red dirt country. It's the people can make livings and become very, very popular in Texas country. There's a country music side and then there's Texas country. And he's a Texas country artist that I've gotten to know because we've done events together. We owned, uh, uh, it's called Go Wheels Up. It's an air show, car show, music festival. It was called Corey Morrow's Go Wheels Up. And so through that process, I've gotten to become best friends with him. And so that's another thing is how do we develop big events around personalities 
more legacy stuff is kind of what we're thinking. It's like, how do you create generational wealth um, that's going to be something that has impact? I want my kids to see the people that I bring to the table and build stuff for. So I can say, I helped build that. Not, I did that. I helped build somebody and put them in that position. I'm not going to turn down becoming famous or whatever, but at the same time, I think where I'm most gifted at is let's raise them to, let's raise people that I love to the level that they can be, and then let's promote the crap out of them, and I can be a part of that. And I love nice. that part. Nice. So for the people people listening, that might be wondering, okay, how does this relate to them? And I think I think the best place to start is maybe around the literacy, literacy side with books. Now, people have websites full of blogs. I mean, they could even repurpose a lot of those blog posts into a book. But there's also the side of if you have a personal brand on your site or the site involves you being an expert, you could also have a book that kind of leverages your own expertise as well. So what would be the benefit of someone going down this road? Say they have the traffic, they're building a following, they've got a relatively large or medium sized audience. Why would why go down the road of doing of I guess a painstaking process of creating yeah. a book? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you said a couple things there. I think uh, there's a lot of myths to writing a book. The first myth is the fact that you have to be a writer. You absolutely do not have to be a writer. I am not a gifted writer. I, I love to read, but I'm also dyslexic. So I have that going for me, you know? So like, how is that? How does it all work together that I can be in this space? Well, the people that are good at editing, the people that are good at writing, those are people that we lean on to do those things. So all you have to have is an idea, a concept, something that you want to flesh out, something that you want to tell the world about. And we have people in those places, ghost writers especially, that are skilled in uh, learning and understanding your voice so that it, it reads as if it's from you. Now, it is from you. You just have somebody that's skilled in that space to be able to, to do that and communicate that. The majority of people, the dirty little secret, it's not really a secret, is... Uh, most people use a ghostwriter. So the idea of you sitting down, some people love the concept of sitting down and writing 40,000, 50,000 words and putting it into a book and forming and crafting it. That's not most people. Most people that you want to hear from just want to stay on task with what they're good at. Hey, like same thing, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, Cam Haynes, he wants to bow hunt. He wants to impact the bow hunting community for the better. He wants to come, he wants to make this world a better place. Um, and he wants people to become better at that craft. He's a bow hunter. So for me to say, hey, hey, bow hunter, you want to, you should write a book. He's thinking, well, I'm not a writer. I'm a bow hunter. And so being able to help people understand that, and that's just one example of many examples that come down to it. As far as promoting your brand and influence, you're right about the blog posts. Hey, it just takes one really good blog post. Four concepts to understanding the best way to do digital marketing. Well, a four concept digital marketing piece, yeah, you can put it in a blog post, but putting it in a book, something that people can have in their hands, a tangible piece or an audio book, an ebook, those types of things are gonna be the best way to really get that voice out there. Yeah, you're gonna have a ton of views on your website to read that blog, but really there's more to it than just those four ideas in, in a simple, concise piece in uh, you know, a thousand words or less. So the book idea is, it just comes from a simple concept. I'm working with a lot of influencers right now, and that's kind of where I love being. Because most influencers, and I say influencers, uh, you know, it could be anywhere from 100,000 to a million followers on any one social media or YouTube or anything like that, that they have, some, they have a story that they wanna tell. And we're not talking like a memoir. Memoirs don't necessarily sell as well as you would think they do. What we do is we take their story and we put it into concepts that they know best that are going to impact with their story uh, across the country and the world, potentially. So we have this space that we call uh, Agent Managed Publishing, and it's pretty popular now. Uh, there's a guy by the name of David Goggins who made it the most mainstream and popular. What he did was he said he wanted to own the content himself, and he wanted to be able to control where it went and how it was done. And so he wrote a book, Agent Managed. And so that means that he pays an upfront cost to publish, to get a ghostwriter, do all those things, but then he benefits from all the back-end sales, all the royalties. And he can then take that concept, that book that he wrote, 
And this is just one example of, of thousands and thousands and thousands of examples. He can take that book and then put it into an e-course. He can put it on his website. No one owns that content except for him. And from, a, from an influencer's perspective, somebody that's built their own content, somebody that's built up their following, that is hugely appealing. And so what it becomes is a piece of the business. Rather than one thing, I'm a writer, you now are a fitness expert, you're, you're, a, you're a writer, you're a best-selling writer. I mean, there's a way to do that within Amazon because 90% of people spend the, buy their books online. So there's so many different ways to build an audience that's bigger than just your audience through the book side. And so what we found is people then take that as one piece of the many pieces. And we haven't even started talking about the fact that if you have a book in your hand that I wrote, that opens up so many opportunities to get on podcasts, to have something to sell, something to talk about. All the podcast circuits, which is huge now. I mean, nobody goes on mainstream media anymore to talk about their products. Yeah, sometimes. But the real benefit is podcast. It, it targets a different reach. You have more available to you. And then ultimately, then we talk speaking. So as you have this book, you have now something to talk about. You might have had a million things to talk about before, but now you have a book to say, hey, I wrote this book. These are the concepts I can do. And getting speaking engagements from that is, is a huge opportunity. Plus, if you have a book, you can charge way more to speak because you are a best-selling author in this space. And so it gives you an opportunity to have things to talk about. That's not just, let me tell you the best running techniques. You know, this is something that's going to be able to expand you. And so I lo absolutely love working with influencers, people that have an understanding of entrepreneurship, because this is just one of the many pieces that can help you build your brand, build your business. And there's no time to like, no, there's no perfect time to say, hey, I'm ready to write a book. I've done enough. I've experienced enough. No, I, I think, Let's, let's start with one and let's talk about a series of books. Let's talk about a fitness manual. Let's talk about a cookbook. Let's talk about a devotional. Let's talk about all those different things that come along with it while starting with one option, one opportunity that allows you to open doors in places that you normally couldn't go. Nice. That, that was awesome. I'm sure there's many people may be spinning their wheels in the head listening to that, but I'm just trying to think now <laughs> with potentially someone in the space, maybe that I don't know, SEO influence or digital market influence, right? Maybe they've had a lot of success building, buying sites and they have mm -hmm. a, a following because of that. What would be an example of a book then that they will cover? Because I'm assuming someone like that, you know, they don't want a biography. No one's going to read a biography on that person. No one really cares. Um, yeah. But maybe they're interested in, you know, the information, the journey, the things they've gone through, you know, to be able to do that, the things they can take away for themselves. What mm -hmm. kind of what kind of, I guess, topics or book would cover something like that? Yeah, I, I think it could, I mean, those are the best books, honestly. Those are the books that do sell because what it allows, it's a, it's a general enough topic with a specific enough, uh, specific enough like focus that people mm. absolutely want to know. And then yeah. it becomes less of a, hey, this personality, James, wrote this book. Well, I don't know James. But I do want to know more about what, the, what they did to build the digital marketing piece of their life yeah. because that's really big right now. Because it's, but what a lot of people do is they spend way too much energy on building it out themselves because they think that's what it takes like they did for their digital marketing world. It's, it's very hands-on. It gets me very – I got to be very in-depth in it and I'd be able to expand it and make it bigger and bigger and bigger and scalable. With the book side is come up with one concept. Hey, I did this. So let me tell you how to do it. And that will allow you then, if you do those types of things, to be able to take that book and then use it to get in front of other creators, other digital marketers, do an e-course where you have continually passive income that comes through just from taking one idea of how did you expand this space? What did you look for in a website that you bought? Or what did you look for a name in a website? And then how did you build it from there? Here's another thing I think you and I have talked about it, James, is how do you build, how do you get affiliates? Like for guys like you, it's like, oh, that's easy. For guys like me who are like, man, I really want to create 10, 20, $30,000 a month in income where I don't have to do that much. That sounds like awesome. So tell me how to do that. And that expands your audience beyond uh, people that are already in that space. So mm. it doesn't take a great, like huge idea just take something that's a, a passion, a desire, something you've done, and then flip that into how do we get 40,000, 30,000, 40,000 words out of it. 
And you'll find it's not as difficult, especially with somebody that helps you on the back end like a ghostwriter. And then that piece will then be the key to building your business even further. Expanding beyond just owning a bunch of websites and building out digital marketing, you now have become a consultant. You've now become a leader in the industry. You've now allowed yourself to put uh, yourself on the forefront and not in a weird way. What a lot of people are worried about is like, hey, I wrote a book. Here's my book. It's published, self-published. Awesome. Great. Not that there's anything wrong with that. My dad self-published most of his books and they're amazing content. And he uses them all throughout the country whenever he goes and speaks. And it helps. But what a lot of people want is they don't want to hawk the book that they self-published. They, they want that established feel and vibe of going, I had a publishing company. I had a literary agent. I had these things. And it does help. It allows mm -hmm. you to put it puts your, it puts you in a position where you already have a position of strength. Even though the mm -hmm. content may be the same. It puts you in a different position. Now with like the Fed agency, for example, where I work, what I do is we are the largest independently owned literary agency in the country. We, I say the world because typically you're not doing like a world. Because Ameri America is the world, right? Yeah, right? So, <laughs> they, right? <laughs> so the, the, the publishing side within what we do is we have not sold out to the larger you know, as much as many people have tried, especially with our roster of clients, is we say we care more about the client than we do about the, the back end piece. We don't, there's the end in the vision in mind of this company isn't to sell it. The vision is to build clients that understand that we're going to be first and foremost for them. If they win, we win. And that's kind of how it's always been. And that's what drew me to it because, yeah, I've had other opportunities at bigger companies. Uh, like larger scale agent managed side of things. But this is something that's designed around, well, obviously we have a huge roster of great authors that everybody wants to listen to. But the other side of it is too, is who are we impacting? What is our ultimate goal? And our ultimate goal here is people first. Story, we have a, we have a passion and a desire to get story out there. And so what I care about most is making sure that your story gets out there in the best possible way. Nice. And I think the nice thing about it is it's accessible for everyone versus the other mm -hmm. route, the the bigger companies. So do you want to just dive into how it usually works? So these oh. bigger companies kind of reach out, they have to reach out to you or you have to try pitch them to basically get an advance to write a book and then you own, you maybe get a small royalty? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So there's, there's three ways to, to publish a book. The first way is that what you described, most people think is, a tr it's the traditional side. It's, we put together a proposal, we pitch it to all the big five publishing companies because all the little publishing companies, they're getting bought up by the bigger boys, which is totally fine because we have great relationships with all the big five uh, around, we call them the New York, New York, we pitch it to New York, that's really where it's at. Um, is we, we have great relationships with them. And so we typically will know your story, your, your impact. The proposal really sets up the marketing plan. Hey, this is what the book summary is going to be about. We don't submit a full book usually. It's these are what the chapters are going to look like. This is the background of the author. These are the things that they're going to be most influenced by. Here's a big event that's happening in 2024, 2025. And that's kind of pro propo propels it into selling it to a publisher. And at that point, then the advance can be anywhere from, you know, 20,000 to, you know, millions, seven figures. And it just depends on that proposal, that influence, that size of the person that's a part of it. And because of that, what we've found is a lot of the times, if you're looking at being a traditional author, is there's a lot of things that have to go into that financially. You're going to need a ghostwriter and that has financial upfront costs. Um, you hope that in the traditional side that the book advance is going to cover that cost. And then from that, then you have deadlines based on the publisher and they have to have their hands in the editing process. So you might write a book with your ghostwriter, but when it goes to the publisher, they, they have complete creative control. And then at that point, then uh, you publish the book and you've already gotten your advance. So until that advance is covered, in the royalty side, when they start selling books, until that advance and that cost of marketing, all the different costs that come into it for the publisher, you don't start receiving any royalties for your book. 
So there's some situations, not all situations, obviously, where you do that process and you'll never see another dime in your book. All the money the book sales until they cover the advance they paid you. And Usually. Then you Usually. Ah, yeah. okay. Well, I mean, not, not always, but you know, that's kind of the concept, right? They're, you're going to get, they're going to get their money in return of your book. They're, they're basically taking a bet on you. Mm. Do you have the following? Do you have the, do you have what it takes? Do you have all these things? We're going to advance you money. We're going to take the cost of publishing, the printing, the, all those different things that come along with it. We're taking all the risk. And mm. then at the end, obviously they want it to sell millions and millions and millions of copies, copies. And then we're always receiving, you're always receiving royalties. That's not always the case, you know, realistically. Now there are quite a few that do that. You know, that's why publishing is still alive. If it didn't work and from a business standpoint, it wouldn't exist. So that's the first side. That's the traditional understanding of things. Here's the, here's the other thing that, that people usually helps in that decision because working with a traditional publisher is great. Working with the people that we work with is awesome. Um, is the problem is right now in publishing, we're two years out. So if you sign a book contract right now to publish a book, it won't come out until 2025. So what a lot of influencers have experienced, and this is why we've created this whole other side of publishing, is a lot of the times what made them famous or what made them influencer, they have to capitalize on now. So waiting two years for a traditional book deal to publish isn't necessarily the best thing financially or business side for them. So that's where self-publishing comes in, right? Like you can pay us, if you don't have as much money, you can spend a smaller amount of money you can submit a manuscript to a publisher, to a publishing, a self-publishing company that will print the book for you and help distribute it based on the cost, whatever. It's a lot lower cost, but the quality is not always there. We have so many people on our team that are experts in what sells a book that it's, it's worth every penny type thing. Uh, so that's one side. We don't, do, we don't handle that self-publishing side. If you want to do that, there's a lot of, you can Google it, you know, type thing. Uh, but the other side that we do, and this is the alternative to the traditional side, is agent managed. And where the positives come in on this is speed. Once you start the process, it can be anywhere from six to eight months to book in hand, book publishing. Mm. And with the stats that we know, this, the 90% of books are bought online. Well, a main component of that is Amazon. I mean, the majority of books are sold on Amazon. So we have a really great team that deals with uh, making that, I mean, as a digital marketer, you understand that, right? You could probably, you probably do the same techniques that we have, but we do it specifically for literary because a lot of our books that are sold on Amazon that we do agent manage, our goal is to get it a bestseller in a, in a, in a, in a category. Mm -hmm. Once that happens, you're a best selling author. You know, it just, it's incredible how we, how we put it together and how we make it work. And so through the whole process of, Hey, we help assign you a ghostwriter. If you need one, if you want one, usually you get one. And then through that process, we work through sub editing, line editing, text editing, we get the cover going so it fits and looks good. And then ultimately into publishing. So everybody does an audio book now. You can't, you can't sell enough copies without one. I mean, 30%, 30 to 40% of people consume that content on Audible or, uh, you know, uh, an auto, uh, audio book. So those are huge pieces to what we do. Making sure that Amazon's set up, making sure you have the best audio book possible and then go to publishing, which you buy wholesale. That's on the, that's on the, the, the author as well. You know, you have to buy a certain number of books, but we give you the best price because we have the best connections. It's all wholesale. And then you get those books printed and most of them go to Amazon, you know, truly, because that's where you sell them. You obviously have some books. If you like speaking and that type of thing, you can get them through that publisher at any time or any, uh, that, that printer, I should say the, you get that printer through any time. But then what that does is ultimately, then here's the other side speed um there's uh influence through that process and then the the money the money side so uh in own, money and ownership sorry so you get to the point of with with the traditional side is basically it's like selling your book rights it's like selling your rights to your story um if you if you sold a movie right like hey somebody optioned your rights to something if you sell it to a traditional publisher they own it so to get that book back, you're either going to have to buy it back from them at a premium. And then a lot of the times you can't create much content out of that book without using them. So if you did want to do the other sides of making money, which are e-courses, 
you know, master classes type thing. Uh, if you wanted to develop that into something deeper, maybe a documentary, anything like that that comes along with it, you have to go through that traditional publisher that bought that book in the first place. Because they're saying, hey, we're putting our, sti our, our uh, flag in the ground and we're saying, you are valuable, we're going to buy it. But in the agent managed side, you have every aspect of the ownership of that book, including the same reason David Goggins would have gotten probably a million dollars from selling his book, instead could make, probably made 10 to 15 million because he got all of the royalties for it. Instead of getting $1 a book, he got 12 to $15 a book. And that is significant. And that's significant, not even on his scale, that's significant on our scale that we're talking about. You have 100,000, 200,000 followers and you sell 5,000 books, which should be pretty easy for somebody that has that type of following, man, you've already broken even, you're already into the profit zone of what it looks like. And so we're just, I mean, just talking about ownership and money, it just makes sense for a lot of people rather than going through the long process of traditional, even though traditional is a great way to go, some people it's just not an option. And so that's where we go with it with most, most people that are entrepreneurs that say, hey, this is my business, I know that ultimately I invest this type of money, I'm going to receive the benefit from it long term. If you print the book and you do all this and you just let it set and you don't do anything, if you don't promote it, if you don't try to sell it, if you don't try to speak, there's no point. The only point is this is another tool in your toolbox that you can pull out and be able to expand all different aspects. And a lot of people aren't utilizing that piece because they think, well, I'm not a writer. Well, they think, oh, I don't, I, I, I maybe down the road. But in reality, what they need to do is look at it from a perspective of use this as a now opportunity and then book two will be even a bigger opportunity. Mm. So it's like leverage for you. Yeah, as you mentioned, leverage for you to actually get out and do other things to further expand. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's probably what I, what I spend a lot of my time doing, James, is helping people understand that part of brand mm. is this, this may not be something that you thought about a week ago. But the truth is, this is something that if you do now, will ultimately <clears throat> leverage your relationships over the next year, two years, three years, and then beyond. Because you're always going to be a writer. You're always going to have a book to sell. You're always going to have those pieces. And so I think that's a huge piece of it. It's not just a flash in the, uh, flash in the pan thing. This is something that's going to hold on for generations. And mm. you can earn money from it for generations based on how you do it. And you know, a lot of people, they think that their book idea, they have this big book idea and it's like the, all this stuff is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think that's three books. You know, you're putting, you're putting a ton of content into one book. What we have to understand is, is how do we utilize what you're doing well now to, to benefit in that space to influence for the future? So what do you want to be speaking about 10 months from now? Because that's mm. what this book should be about. Okay, that, that's a good, good way to frame it as well. And you mentioned obviously becoming a bestseller on Amazon. How, how, what, what tactics are you using to do that? Are you able to share any of those? Yeah, a lot of it is um, I can't, unfortunately, because it is, uh, <laughs> it's what makes us valuable, right? And what makes the, the system by which we sell these or even sell a book to a traditional publisher are um, not industry secrets necessarily, but they're things that make us valuable. So a lot of the stuff um, I can't share super freely, but what I can say is we are really good at understanding what um, categories sell really well. And so you may not think that your book categorizes in certain things, but we can get those things classified based on a lot of things we know about the book that will allow you to be a bestseller in certain categories that normally wouldn't even show. And because of being a bestseller in a category, whatever that category is, you pop up to the top of the list pretty quick. You're, you're labeled a bestseller. And so because of that, you're put into a lot of more flows. You're put into a lot more cues. It's just like AdWords. It's just like AdSense. Your name starts popping up higher. Um, so it's a similar technique that we use and utilize. Um, and we have a whole team that does it. Nice. Okay. So if you want the secret sauce, you got to go through Mitch uh, yeah. and, and go through, go through there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But, um, we talked about obviously leveraging the book and you can go into speaking events. Maybe we'll start with the speaking, speaking yeah. side. I mean, I think a lot of people maybe in a space are more introverted, maybe don't want to public speak and things like mm -hmm. that. But, mm -hmm. but I guess the question, if someone wanted to go down that road, how do you, how do you even start something like that? I'm assuming you need the existing relationships to be able to go and speak somewhere. And you know, when you're speaking somewhere, how are you gathering the audience to do that? I'm assuming you, you would already need kind of the influence there to be able to do something like this. If you didn't have the audience, you, you're not going to find many uh, people coming to see you. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple ways to do it. The, my technique is how um, I've made a living. So what we do is um, typically people that want to write a book or that are already influencers in this space aren't afraid to get in front of a camera. That's first. If you're afraid to get in front of your social media and do a story and talk about yourself or promote something because you're not a self-promoter, then it's probably not for you, honestly. That's kind of more the spot of where if that book is, is sitting on yourself and you can point to it and look at it and you wanted to invest that type of money just so you could point and look at it, that's fine, but that's not what we're describing. We're describing an overall look at what it looks like. So there's many ways to do it. The first way is within our, we call it our fed books. We call it, you, when you're published through our agent manager, we call it fed books. Through our fed book size, we have, a, we have different layers of speaking sides. So we can even include that with the package. Hey, when my book launches, I want to be put in these scenarios in front of this many people, that type of thing. And we can establish and set that up. Um, as far as like a larger scale, a lot of people that have a following of influence, they get asked to speak. And a lot of times it seems overwhelming. It seems like it's not credible, like all those different things. So ultimately they, they don't do it or they put it off and they don't capitalize. And so a lot of times what we typically do is just say, hey, listen, just with having a book, you're already going to have an ability and something for people to reach out to you and say, hey, I'd love for you to come speak to my team. I'd love for you to come to our corporate retreat. I'd love, and you can't just think like, hey, sitting in front of 500 people at Paramount Theater in Austin, and that's my, that's my presentation. That's not always the case. We're talking smaller groups. We're talking consulting, and especially in your space. That's going to be huge in a lot of opportunities, and that really is where the money's made because you're spending very little time with uh, the same content you know about, that you wrote a book about, and all you do is just add value to that team. That's how it works. So it's not necessarily the best speakers or people that are introverts. Uh, you know, It's not usually the best speakers or people that are introverts. It's like a mix of everything uh, because those type of opportunities are still speaking uh, opportunities that get you business long term. Um, as far as like a bigger scale, so this is kind of where I work in because I like things that are very scalable. If I'm doing something with um, a, bigger, uh, a bigger name, so to speak, and they're, they're drawing speaking opportunities constantly. They're getting emailed on their website. Hey, I'd love for you to speak. I'd love for you to speak. They're trying to manage all that. And typically, they have a manager, a booking manager that does all that, right? Um, what I like to pitch to those people and people that, I mean, it doesn't even have to be that huge of an audience that you have. Most people don't realize the draw they have in certain areas is what if we put together a, a tour where we add a bunch of your people that you love, friends, and we, we conclude a you know, X, Y, and Z and friends tour that goes around and does something that's interactive, that's unique, that's something that's special where most people don't get that opportunity. Most people don't get access to certain people that they love. Only They only consume it through social media. So when you give them an opportunity to come to a city near you, just like a band, but in a, at, a, at a scale to which their audience understands and make it accessible, accessible financially, and then also accessibility to the person. So, hey, let's, it's just like what I was telling you uh, the other day was, let's take what you're really good at, what people know you for. And let's give them an opportunity to participate in that with you. And those are all our other aspects that we do. And people don't realize what people will pay to interact with you at this level that they know you. And uh, it, whether it's running, whether it's bow hunting, whether it's whatever, those things are all appealing to a lot of different people. Because I know when uh, during the COVID world, I was way overweight. I was a couch potato. I had nothing to do but sit and wait because my event company shut down because there was no events. Uh, and I had time, all but time on my hands. And I started listening and consuming podcasts. And in those podcasts, friend, people like Cameron Haynes and David Goggins, they were the main people that motivated me to go, I, uh, I'm gonna change my life. I'm gonna start running every day. I'm gonna lose 50 pounds. I'm gonna do all these things that are necessary for me to be able to be healthy, long-term happy, stop being depressed, stop feeling sorry for myself. And that's what I did. And then I had an opportunity to actually interact and meet Cam Haynes at his own turf, run a, a, run a mountain with him that he runs every day. That's a dream come true for most people. Now it was the worst day of my life. And I can tell you that's a whole other podcast. It was the best day and the worst day all wrapped up into one. But ultimately 
what I realize is people need to have this experience. And people can't always, aren't always connected to people that they know. I was mm-hmm. lucky to have a friend that knew him. And I used to live in Eugene, so it was easy for me to go visit family and friends. And then I could run with them. So how do we create something accessible, affordable, and something that really connects and interacts with fans? So that, again, that intersection that people have in events that happens in that community setting. That's exactly what we try to do. And I, I'm not overselling this because ultimately that's what people want. People want meaningful interaction with people that have impacted them because it's not just about that person anymore. What happens, especially in a group setting, when you get hundred people together that all love the same thing before, before a while, it doesn't matter that the main guy that you love is there. What matters is you now have a group of a hundred people that all have the same, that, that build mm. this community. Now you have this shared experience that changes your life. And that is exactly why I loved working in the church world because that's what you created every Sunday. Whether you like church or don't like church, whatever, that's what we did. We wanted to create a meaningful experience, a shared experience within a community. And that's what events are too. And that's what a book, again, not to oversell it, I'm an optimist, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a motivator, I love doing this stuff, is if you have something that people want to know, or maybe they, maybe they don't even know they want to know it, but you give them an opportunity to experience it in a unique way, speaking tours are just the start. People pay, I paid, I paid a lot of money one time to go see a podcast that my wife liked done live just Mm. because she likes them. Hey, this is a cool experience. That's becoming more and more popular just because you get that unique seat. It's like you listen to them, you do this, this is something you do. That's just the tip of the iceberg of what we could do with somebody that's creative, that's an entrepreneur, that's somebody that understands business or understands the idea of growing a business and brand. Because that's what a brand is. It's a business. And so that's what I love doing. I love creating. I love talking through these things. Books are simple. And there's a lot of people in my office that do all the hard stuff. I like the connection. I like the relationship. Let's get you to where you can ultimately be successful in a book. And then let's look at all the different aspects that we can do to add on to that. And I haven't even started talking about personality type, skill set in speaking, uh, opportunity, like any of that stuff. That's a whole other side of things. If you're also a good speaker, well, let's go. I mean, that's even better. (laughs) That's not required. I think that's what we forget is like we have in our mind what we think it needs to be and it's not that. Because the majority of writers, the majority of people that put out content, the majority of influencers, this could be another step to get them to reach the goals they want, the half a million followers, the million followers. It's all a part of adding to those pieces. Nice. And you mentioned events there as well. I want to go down that event route because a lot of people... I think when we talk events, we think conferences, and that's the big thing. So within digital marketing, you've got various conferences around the world. Um, I had a coach uh, who's part of my, my business. He wants to do like a workshop next year or something like that where <clears throat> we bring coaches or athletes and we run through a lot of the, the new, I guess, discoveries within training for certain combat sports and things like that. But that's kind of like, you do have the community aspect. Everyone's kind of there to learn, but it's kind of dry and a lot of people, I guess, are doing that. There's so many of them. So how would you jazz that up? As you mentioned, you talked about experience together with community and things like that. Obviously the conference is the kind of lowest level you can kind of start. What would you add to something like this to make it more appealing or be able to, I'm assuming you'd be able to charge more because you have some of these experiences too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you, you, uh, I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. I've also seen it when it failed, you know, I've, I've seen it fail. I've seen it be successful. So I think uh, a couple things to that is, first and foremost, workshops are low-hanging fruit. So always do those. Always continue to option those. What I think people forget is, just like what you said, they're a little dry. Steve, people still buy the tickets. People still want that workshop idea. So don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to those things. It's because workshops do work. What we need to do is start integrating that shared experience to create unique experiences while taking the people that normally are going to go, hey, I'm just going to go to a work. That, I want to do a workshop. Because there are some things that you could do that make people come out of their comfort zone. Running a, a mountain with Cam Haynes was out of my comfort zone. It was, a hor- it was hard. It was, it was uncomfortable. It put me in a position where I had to do most of the work to get there, to go up there right? He met me there. Um, 
that is, that's a separate look. There, there's got to be a levels. So let's say workshops are the lowest common denominator, lowest hanging fruit, we'll say. And what I experienced with Cam is the highest. Like that is the hardest thing to experience. You have to have really unique relationships. You have to have the work. Like I had to be prepared physically already. I was always ready to be there, even though I never knew I'd be there, right? So those are where we really can create cool experiences in, the, in those middle notches. And so when you talk about like punching up a workshop, I think there's opportunities that lie really beyond what people really want. What people want is connection and community. They want to be known. They want to be heard. They want to be loved. I mean, those are the basic things of most people. And especially when it comes to men specifically, we don't ever want to say this, but man, there's nothing better than having a good male relationship and a good connection. But I'm not going to go, hey, hey, I need somebody. I need a friend. You know, I'm just not. Now, I don't think many people do that that way. But the truth is we seek out communities of common interest all the time. So let's just say from your perspective of common interest, um, you know, I know you're in the MMA world, you're in the, the rugby world, you're in the physical space, right? Um, there are so many men out there that desperately want to know how to defend themselves that are unwilling to go, hey, I'm afraid I'm going to get my ass beat. I mean, that is the truth. And if you create an opportunity for them to understand the basics of how to defend yourself, of how to, and this is just specifically to you, is what I would think would be an appealing thing is because I know you as a, as a person that I've gotten to know over the last couple of weeks, but I would not be intimidated to come to your house with a group of people and you show us how to choke someone out or you show us how to, how to run when we need to run or the scenarios to which come when we need to be able to be put in a situation where I can defend my family or I know when to back away or I know how to de-escalate. Those, okay, so I don't know if this rings at home at all. I'm just trying to give you a good example of what you could, do, what you could create to give people that opportunity. I think Tim Kennedy does this the best. Now, if you could get in, because it's always sold out. Um, and also, I am terrified to do it. Like, the way that it looks is he goes around and just beats the shit out of people. And then ultimately, you have to be like, oh, well, I'll learn from this. Like, you get broken down and then built back up. That's the, that's this here. That's the Cam Haynes experience. Like those things I want to do, but I'm terrified. So where do we come in the middle where we can help people come? We can come together. It, it gets a bigger audience because ultimately what people are okay with, and this is what we're doing with Cam Haynes, is people want to work out with Cam, but they don't want to do what I did. The one-on-one, -on -one, he sees you fail. He sees how crappy you are. That hurts me. I don't want him to see how out of shape I am. I don't want him to see I can't do it. Even though he treats me with respect as a common, like he treated me ultimately like I was an equal, which is insane and so gracious. We create opportunities within conferences, within workshops to be able to have those cool experiences. So you already have the workshop people here. So let's bring something into where, hey, let's do this together. Let's experience this together. What we're doing with Cam in a lot of settings now, this is all um, this is all still in the works, right? Like we this this has happened in the past, but I'm still working on it. So look for those dates, type of thing, right? Um, is we give an opportunity to anybody that's coming to the event, to the speaking event, if you would like to work out with Cam today or tomorrow, you can come here and we're going to do a mass workout. And a mass workout is. Hey, we're going to put you in a situation where you, you can do anybody works at their own pace. And so it's very much a meet, meet you where you're at, but you get to talk about this experience. You get to take a picture with them. You get to say, Hey, I worked out with him. Somebody that's, that's, has impacted me through those things or like the best, again, I hate to just harp on the cam thing. A lot of people in the, the bow hunting space, they just want to shoot with them, right? Mm. Like that's, and that's not very difficult, but you don't have an opportunity to go up to Eugene usually and go bow hunting or like knock on his door. <laughs> yeah. So like there's, there's a real look at like, how do we, how do we make that an opportunity that people can have that's affordable and that's available? And those are some things that come along with that. So just thinking outside the box with how you do it. I think of it from a fan standpoint as a fan 
I would love for the undertaker to show us all how to do the move that he did. <laughs> yeah. Not, not perform it. Like, I don't want to like act and do the, the ring. Like that's, that's extreme over here. That's the top level. But man, it'd be really cool to go into like a little space where the undertaker shows us the move. And yeah, those are all things that are special and unique. And it's hard sometimes to sell those pieces, but once they experience it, they're going to ultimately do it again and mm. they're going to pay more for it. And they're going to invite their friends to come and experience it because yeah. it was the most, ex like that's what it costs about building a brand. And that's what I think people are afraid of taking chances. People are afraid of doing things that are out of their comfort zone is because ultimately the biggest impact you can have is creating something special like that. That's a risk. I don't know if people will show up to that, but I do know I want to do it. And that means that I'm going to put everything I have to put it together. And so those are just the different aspects that can come along with it. You just got to think a little bit outside the box. Mm. You got to start thinking like somebody that's just a fan. I sometimes go back to, this is where I got, I was successful in the church world. I did a lot of cool things and cool events in the church world. Because if I, I said, if I was coming, this is what I want. And mm. I was giving great bosses that said, do it. Hey, get a full-size Ferris wheel in the front of the parking lot. So people can ride the Ferris wheel. Bring a full-size train to take people from the bottom of the parking lot to the top of the parking lot, only kids and their families. Like those types of things are fun that you'll talk about forever, but I'm not going to tell you the back end of how frustrating and how hard it was to get that train off that trailer. I'm not going to tell you how late it was for church, so I couldn't, like half of the people that came didn't experience it. Those are all parts of the fun part of the story. One time I rented a baby uh, giraffe for an event. This is just this is just How do you even do that? <laughs> exactly. I said, okay, this is how it started. And this is what we got to start thinking about outside the box, James. This is what influencers are good. This is why so many influencers are so famous is because they think this way. They think, what would be really cool? What would I want to see if I was watching right now? Mm -hmm. So I said, man, I, have, I would love to be able to see a baby giraffe. Just walking around. Like, the, you know, you got this big yard. It's like just walking around. You can feed it. You can hang out with it, whatever. But the one thing in my mind I had was how cool it would it be to be everybody waiting for the baby giraffe to come out of the trailer or whatever it's in and then watch it walk like baby giraffe walk, you know, like stumble yeah. all down. I just thought it'd be the coolest thing ever. And so I promoted it like that. Hey, we're going to do we're going to have a baby giraffe. And that was the one thing that I promoted. And that was all the money I spent on my budget. The baby <laughs> giraffe showed up two hours late. And so from that experience. But sure enough, man, it was frustrating. It was scary. It was like almost on the point of failure. And then the flipping giraffe showed up and it sure enough wobbled out of the, and everybody just like, huh, ah! took a video <laughs> of pictures. Like it changed people's lives. The people that were there forever marked and changed. We'll forever talk about the time that we brought a baby giraffe and they got to feed it. They got to pet it. They got to do all the things that you get to do with a six foot giraffe. And it was one of the best experiences possible. It was an utter failure for two hours. And then it became something that changed people's lives. And I think people are afraid of taking those chances and opportunities mm. because one, I think they're afraid of failure first, but you got to get past that. It's silly. You know, like, Hey, you know, workshops work. They do. They bring in money. They bring in fans. They bring in people. But what can we do to elevate that to make it something that people will never forget? Because they can go to workshops all over the country. Just like you said, they're a little dry. They've overdone all those different things. People still go to them. But what can we do to shift and change the perspective of what those things are? We have an active audience. Let's shift it to make it, let's make it the giraffe day. Like let's do those things that are going to shift the way that we do things. The line for the Ferris wheel that we had was so long, but people still talk about that two hour wait that they had and they rode a Ferris wheel in front of a, a building. That they didn't cost money. It was a special thing. It's all those different things that come along with it. So you got to start thinking in that perspective. And these things I'm saying don't cost a ton of money. It's just you have to think that way. What will it look like to do these things? Innovative, entrepreneurs, everything your audience has already. They're mm. entrepreneurs, they're brand builders. Like just start thinking that way and those will shift. If, you know, if they want to ultimately do an event like that, that's easy to plan. It's easy to come together. Um, but most people don't even start. Yeah, I'm just thinking it because Mona's relatively well known within weightlifting, even within Austin, different gyms. She's run multiple workshops before um, within that. But I think like what a lot of the other 
Olympians did as well as they trained at the end of it. So you had a chance to train with these athletes in the gym. So you did the full workshop with them and at the end you train with them and that, that was part of the experience. And obviously they were able to charge a pack and I was thinking now like Modi could probably do the same, you know, like you learn, you learn all the technical nuances that she has for the snatch and clean and jerk. And then at the end you get to train with her and see them train and train on the platform next to them, that kind of thing, you know, and that's, that's an experience in itself tell everybody about those are things that you tell for years down the road and most people don't have those i mean the average person that you meet hasn't ever done something that that's special they have their fans of certain things they watch stuff on tv or netflix and they go man that would be so cool but they don't go further than that and so if we can if we can make the barrier way less and allow people an opportunity to do that if they want to act we'll give them an opportunity to act and I think that's taking that active audience and taking it to the next level. Um, I think there's some people that do it really, really well. Um, one of those guys is named Jesse Itzler. Um, he is, uh, he's been on Rogan a couple times, written some books, but he's like more in the athlete space. But he comes from a space of, he may not be the best athlete, the fastest athlete, the whatever. He works hard. He does the work. He does all those things. But what he's really good at is creating community around it. So in a lot of ways, he is the brand, but he brings all these other influencers and people around him that we feel all a part of it. I showed up to something at 7 a.m. in downtown Austin just so I could meet them. It was free. Hey, throw it on Instagram. Hey, we're going to ride. They were doing like this, this bicycle thing across the country with 10 of them. And I was following them on Instagram because I follow about three of the four of the guys, right? And they're like, hey, we're going to be in Austin this day. I'm like, sick, I'll be there. So I roll up at 6.30, hoping to just meet them, shake their hands, tell them thanks, you know, that type of thing. And what, I, what it became was a full, like, panel, like, bringing us all into the experience. There was about 100 people that showed up. And not only that, like, through that experience, I met multiple people I follow on Instagram that are a little less influencers, like, lesser known, but are growing and growing. And it's like, dude, it is just so cool to meet you. I've... I consume your content. That was just made from his mind. He just said, hey, we're going to be here. Everybody come. Anybody who's here, just enjoy it. And he treated, he talked to every single person and he, he shook everybody's hands. He didn't think about, oh, we got to get going. We still have uh, 1,500 miles to go, like that, that type of thing. He honestly made everybody feel, he knew some, didn't know a lot. He made me feel like we were friends, you know, and he's a guy with millions of followers. He's a billionaire. Like, he doesn't have to do that stuff. And I think we forget that we get so consumed with the millions and we forget about the individual. And what he did to me and for me made me a fan for life. And that's, and how, you create, that, that's how you create super fans, right? I'm you about it. Yeah. Say what? That's how you create super fans, right? And if you release something, you'll probably buy it. Just, you know, you exactly. mentioned you have the yeah. Exactly. I want to be a part of all the things that he creates because he made me feel that way. And I mm. think in the, and this is one thing I think with, especially in our world, with building brands, social media, how things become so large so fast is it is still okay to take the time necessary to get to know the individual person, to connect. It really doesn't take that much time to shake someone's hand and say thanks. But I think we get so consumed with leveling up, looking around the room, who else is here, that mm. we forget that ultimately the win comes when we connect individually and that person feels like they're the only person there. Yeah. And you can scale that. Like people forget that you can, like how many people do we meet throughout the day? I mean, I probably talked to four or five different people yesterday and you were one of them, mm. right? Like it's not like I was fully consumed with, oh, I had to say hello to like the hundred people I walked past. But that's an opportunity for every single influencer, somebody that's building a brand to create something that's special. And he doesn't, he didn't have to do it, number one, but he also, it's not something super unique. He didn't. He just created the opportunity. Hey, come. We're doing this anyway. Yeah. Just be part of it. And I think there's there's something special about that. And we have to remember the individual is very important. And that's why I think every book sale is important. That's why I think every post is so important. That's why I think allowing like what you're what you're saying Mona did, like that's why that's so important is giving mm -hmm. that individual attention to each person so that they feel important and special. That's going to grow a brand long term and it's not it's not going to stop if something bad happens. If you 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 hit a bump in the road, like they're going to they're going to know you individually and get you to that point. So, 
you know, I, I digress from all that, right? I'm just <laughs> kind of more describing that brand yeah. piece that comes along with it. No, I love it. I love it. That's the perfect, I think that's the perfect way to end this podcast. And yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that people will listen to this start to think because obviously people are getting a little scared with Google AI and a lot of stuff with their websites yeah. and the Google traffic as a way to really build a, a really, I guess you could say influential brand and brand that's worth a lot more than just something that's, you know, just on the internet too. So, but if anyone wants to find you and follow you, Mitch, and, and kind of get to know what you're doing and things, where can they do that? Uh, I have a personal website, Mitch Royer at uh, MitchRoyer.com. They can follow me there um, or uh, Instagram, go for Mitch. Geo space F O R. Well, you're on Instagram, I don't think. Oh, don't Instagram. say that. No, I, I mean, will, everybody I will calls right now. me on it. Everybody knows. <laughs> um, go for Mitch. So F O R M I T C H. And there's spaces in between each letter. Somebody grabbed it before I could get the full one. Dude, but I'll buy it. Followers. You got to Yeah, yeah dude. Serious. Only, only a few of them aren't bots, so it's perfect. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <No, that's funny. laughs> we'll leave that in the description too. Say what? We'll link those all up in the description too for uh, everyone to find. I appreciate that. And, you know, if there's anything else in the meantime, if, if there's somebody listening that wants to talk more, I, I would love to speak on the phone, Zoom, anything like that, just to discuss the, where they're at, ultimately where they could go. Um, yeah, obviously I want you to write a book and I want you to do it through me. But I think more importantly, I want more people to be able to uh, connect with other individuals in their community, which is the most important. Nice. I'm going to tag a few people when this goes up on Twitter as well and see if they'll be interested. But uh, no, thanks for coming, Mitch. I appreciate you uh, sharing all, all this knowledge. Hey, it's been a pleasure, James. Thanks so much. Thanks for taking the time.